is. Okay, we're getting live in a moment. Hi, Gabriel, how are you? Okay, we are starting in. Okay, we are ready to start. Nice to see everybody. Good evening, welcome to our Wednesday night class. Any of one who's watching this on YouTube, please help us grow our YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button at the bottom. Uh, those of you watching us live now, you obviously don't have that, but anyone who's gonna be watching it later on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so we can grow it so we can spread more Torah. Bezrat Hashem, please God. Okay, I'm gonna mute everybody. Mark, not specifically to you, don't worry, don't take it personally. You're already muted. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So welcome. T tonight, this week, we are studying Parashat Re'eh. Parashat Re'eh um, is one of the, the, the Torah portions that starts reminding us that Rosh Hashanah is coming up. Look ahead. We have uh, Sun Elul, and then we've got four weeks. So we have, what do we have? we have five, six weeks till Rosh Hashanah. Time is flying. And um, please, God, will have a great Rosh Hashanah this year and Yom Kippur and a successful one. So this week, we're not going to pay attention and focus on the beginning of this week's Torah portion. We're going to focus on some amazing novelties that Zer Shimshon has to share with us, specifically with the mitzvah of tzedakah, of giving charity, as there is mentions of this in this week's Torah portion. Before we do that, I want to just mention tonight's sponsors. We have two sponsors for tonight's class. And again, thank you very much. Expressing my gratitude. I really appreciate it. Um, first is Gabriel Recon in honor of his mother's 83rd birthday. Um, Nelly Bat Amira, may she live till 120 in good health, happiness, um, and prosperity and enjoy her children and her grandchildren. Amen. So thank you very much, Gabriel, for your continued support. And uh, our second sponsor for tonight is my brother, uh, Gregory and Dana Laredo, in honor of our brother's wedding next week, Adam, uh, who is marrying Adina. This is next Tuesday night. So uh, thank you uh, to Greg and Dana and a big mazel tov to Adam, my parents, and to, to the entire family. So very exciting. Uh, even uh, just to mention next week, even though the wedding is on Tuesday night, we still have class as regular on on uh, Wednesday night, please God. Okay, this week's parsha, we're going to jump into a verse, which is one of the sources that uh, our Torah records the importance of tithing, the importance of giving to the needy, giving to the Kohen, giving to the Levi, giving to the temple, to the Bet HaMikdash. And I'm going to share with you the verse so we can all be on the same page. Okay, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. Aser te aser, which means in a redundant manner, you shall tithe. Et kol tevuat zarecha, all of the seed of your crop, hayotze asadeh shana shana, that the field gives forth year by year. And there's so much to learn from this verse. Um, just from the very end of the verse where it says year by year, shana shana, we learn that there's an obligation to split the tithing of the produce from one year to the next. You make a calculation. It's kind of like accounting to all of you accountants listening in. There's a fiscal year when it comes to the accounting for one's personal um, gains as well as for a business. So too, when it comes to tithing produce, the Torah gives a fiscal um, separation and distinction between one year's tithing and produce that needs to be tithed versus a, another. Now, can you roll off some write-offs from one year to a next, uh, like people do in accounting? Not when it comes to, not when it comes to tithing produce. So that's toward the end of the verse. But the main part I want us to pay attention to is the beginning of the verse, and that's aser to aser. Uh, aser literally is the same words as eser, which means ten. As we know, the obligation we have to tithe is 10% of our, of our earnings. And so too, 
10% of our crop back in the day. The truth is, is there's multiple calculations and multiple tithings that had to be done uh, beyond the scope of tonight's class. Um, but it came out that people used to tithe more than 10% when it had to be um, anything doing with, with the crop that, uh, and, 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 and the produce that a person had to tithe. Nevertheless, the Zer Shimshon has uh, a question on this verse, and he poses it through a Midrash. The Midrash says on this very verse that if a person has the merit to give maser, to give charity, to tithe their earnings, or back in the day, their produce, that they will go out and they will be able to sow the field. They'd be able to work the field. But unfortunately, the Midrash continues and says that if a person does not tithe their produce, then the one who goes out to the field will provoke you. And the Midrash says, who's the one who will go out to the field to provoke you? Who would that be? It's referring to a sav. Esav, go back all the way to Jacob's twin brother, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. Esav is referred to as a man of the field, and he'll be the one who will come out and provoke you, says the Midrash. Now, how do we know that Esav is the man of the field? Take a look back at your screen. Oh, I actually didn't put it on. My sorry. My, I'm very sorry about that. The verse is in, I actually didn't prepare. The verse is in Genesis chapter 25, verse 27, where the verse refers to Esav as a man of the field, a ish yodea tzaid ish sadeh, a person who is a hunter and knows the field. This is what the Midrash says. So again, the Midrash in a synopsis says, if you merit to give your charity, your maaser, to tithe your produce, you will have the opportunity to go out and sow your field. If you don't, unfortunately, the one who goes out to, feel, to the field, which is Esav, will come and provoke you. Ask the Zer Shimshon a, a question that is quite obvious to ourselves, is why is the punishment of not tithing your produce that Esav, and obviously Esav has passed away, will be his descendants, his offspring, why is it that Esav will be the one to provoke us? Out of all punishments that can be, I mean, God forbid, we can say that, that everything will go up in flames or that everything will rot or that uh, another person or another army or other descendants will be the ones that come and take over and provoke. Why specifically Esav? It's a good question. Listen to what the Zer Shimshon explains. He says that if you remember something very special about Esav, we remember that Esav was a trickster. Who did he fool? Who was he able to trick? Was he able to trick his mother, Rivka? No. He was able to trick his father. And now there's a lot that we've spoken about in the past that we could even get into now. It's not time for now. How did Esav really trick his father? Did he not? However, Esav according to many interpretations, at least according to his intention, was he did trick his father with regard to a certain mitzvah, a certain, a certain commandment, which was that? The mitzvah of tithing. How so? He would come to his father with produce and he'd say, Father, how do I tithe this produce? And he would do so. And then Rashi tells us, he, Esav would come to his father and he would tell him, Abba, how do I tithe salt? And his father looked at him and said, oh, my son, salt is not something that grows and salt does not need, need to be tithed. Now, Esav knew that. Esav wasn't such a righteous person that he tithed everything he had anyways to the, to the, to the point where he would come and re request, does he need to tithe salt? Of course, that was a pious question, but he was trying to trick and fool his father, explains Rashi and many other commentaries. Nevertheless, the Zer Shimshon says we see a connection between a sav and something to do with the mitzvah, the commandment of tithing. As we see, that's how he tried to trick his father. The Zer Shimshon goes on to explain the greatest gift that Abraham was given was the fact that his descendants will be the ones who will inherit and live in the land of Israel, that it would belong to them. To the point where, when Abraham was promised this, 
He went and he built an altar to thank God. Take a look at your screen. This is in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. Vayira Adonai el Avram, and God appeared to Abraham. Vayomer lezaracha tenet aretz hazot. And he, God tells Abraham, this land will be given to your descendants, to your offspring. Vayiven sham mizbeach ladonai hanire elav. And Abraham builds an altar to thank God where he appeared to him. He brought sacrifices at that moment. We don't see that by any other promise. It's evident, explains the Zashim Shun, that the greatest promise that God makes to Abraham is the fact that his descendants will inherit the land of Israel. However, and I'm taking us back a lot of the things we'll be speaking about this evening, we've spoken about in the past, but the Zeshim Shon puts it together in a beautiful way. At that point, when Abraham was promised that his descendants will inherit the land of Israel, and they will inhabit it, it will be theirs. At that point, it was occupied by the Kenanim and, and others. There was really seven nations that lived in the land of Israel at that time. And God comes to Abraham and promises him to remove them in order to give it to his own descendants, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It may look, however, as if the Jewish people stole the land from the seven inhabitants. Am I jogging your memory? Well, yes, I am. The very first Rashi, the opening Rashi commentary on our entire Torah addresses exactly this. Rashi asks, why does the Torah not start from the first commandment that God gave to the Jewish people, which was counting the new month, all the way in the 12th chapter of Exodus? Why is there a book and a half beforehand? In order to prove to the entire world, to the entire creation, that God himself created the world. And he is the owner completely. And he has the right to endear, to give any land anywhere in this world at any time to anyone. And at that time, it was given, he promised it to the the, the, the Jewish people. Now, what did God do, explains the Zer Shimshon, to prove that the land that the entire world belongs to God. And for our sake, that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. He commanded the Jewish people to tithe their produce, to tithe their animals. This is a mitzvah, a commandment, which is specific to living in the land of Israel. Why did God do this? Explains the Zer Shimshon. Maaser, tithing, is like a tax. It's like a duty that is owed to God. God did this in order to prove to the entire world, to entire creation, from back then all the way till today, that he is the creator and he is the owner. And what are we doing as Jews when we live in the land of Israel and we do tithe our produce and tithe our animals? We are proving that this land that we are reaping benefit from belongs to God. And we are paying our dues, so to say. Therefore, the merit... To live in the land of Israel, explains the Zer Shimshon, is when one admits, a person has to admit, that God is the true owner of the entire world. And this land specifically, how does a person prove that? By diligently giving ma'aser, by diligently tithing their produce, explains the Zer Shimshon. So now the Zer Shimshon ties it together, okay? This is why... A sav is the punishment that the Jewish people will have to endure if we don't tithe our produce. A sav tried so hard to show Isaac, his father, that he was the one who was meritorious to receive the land of Israel. How so? By coming with questions, even setting up his father of how do I tithe this and how do I tithe that and how do I tithe salt? Why? Because he wanted Isaac to endear him with the gift that was promised to his grandfather, to Abraham. Esav wanted it for himself. Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, was a part of the blessing that Isaac gave to Jacob. 
It was that very blessing that Esav himself knew was going to be delivered, and he wanted it. And that's why he came to his father and said, let me feed you, and let me prepare for the blessing. And that's when Rivka so swiftly made sure that Jacob would receive that blessing. Because Esav was trying to secure for himself the land of Israel and for his descendants. And Rivka, and obviously God, knew better. So to answer why, explains Ezer Shimshon, Esav is the one who will provoke the Jewish people if they do not tithe. Remember what the Midrash said, if we tithe, then we will have the merit to sow the land, to plant and to reap more in the, for, in, the, in, in the upcoming years and upcoming seasons. And if not, Esav will be the one to provoke us. Why Esav? Ezer Shimshon says, because the punishment for not tithing will be Esav because Esav is always ready to come and take what he b- thinks belongs to him, which with what he set up to take from his father that he couldn't get back then. He's trying to come back and get it now, explains the Zer Shimshon. He can only do this when we don't live up to our deal, when we don't live up to our tax, our duty that we need to give back to God by helping those which are in need, by contributing back to the temple, by giving to the Kohanim, to the Levi'im, those who dedicate their life completely to God. It is only with tithing that a person has merit to live in the land in Israel. As long as the Jewish people tithe, they are showing that they recognize that God is the true owner of the land And that the Bnei Israel, the Jewish people, truly desire to live in this land. So this is the first section we'll be speaking about this evening. And just as an important lesson, I think it's quite evident that tithing saves a person from being provoked, whether it be by other people, by other circumstances, by enemies, by the aggressions of Esav. And we saw specifically why it is Esav that the Midrash says will come back against us. But don't forget the beginning part of the Midrash that says that a person who does tithe will have the merit to reap benefit from the soil in the upcoming seasons. Now, on the same topic, the Zer Shimshon um, quotes a very famous verse. On this, on the, the verse that we spoke about, this is again chapter, I'm going to show it to you, chapter 14. This is in this week's Torah portion, chapter 14, verse 22. As we will read it again for anyone who just came in. You shall tithe all the seed crop that the field gives forth year by year. Now, the Zashim Shon quotes a famous verse. You're going to please God enjoy a beautiful insight from the Zashim Shon that is written in the last chapter in Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, Havil et kol ma'aser el bet ha'otzar. Bring the whole of the tithes into the treasury, vihi teref beti, so that there may be nourishment in my house. Uvchanuni na bezot. And test me now therewith. Amar Hashem Tzavakot, as God said, Test me to see if I will not open up the heavens and pour down blessing until there's no room for it even to suffice. So the Zer Shimshon asks a prominent question. Question number one, what's the need to have the word kol? Have you et kol hamaaster? To bring all the tithes, the whole of the tithes. The verse could have very easily written, you know, I'm going to just remove it so you could see how it would look. Imagine the verse read as, fa- as such. Haviu et et hamaaser el bet haotzar. Bring the tithe. Why does it have to say et kol hamaaser? All of the tithing. Meaning, the Zer Shimshon wants to know if a person would only bring a part of what they owe, could they ever expect any reward? If you're expected to give 10% and you only give 5%, do you think you have the merit and the reward of tithing? Not, not so. A person who avoids giving maaser is actually losing. He brings this from a midrash. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the screen share, and then I'll get back to, to, to the second question in a moment. The Zashim Shon quotes a midrash of a fellow 
to prove the point that a person unfortunately loses when they don't tithe their produce, their earnings, their gains. Midrash tells us about a story of a wealthy man who always gave his charity. He always tithed his produce. And he was a very, he was uh, progressively gaining and, and, and making even more and acquiring even more. He was a man who was truly, truly blessed. When he passed away, unfortunately, his children did not keep up with the same giving habits. They said, there's so much. <laughs> How could we part from it? And they were a little more greedy. They weren't giving their 10%. They weren't tithing properly. They were cutting corners. And slowly by slowly, year after year, didn't take too long, they ended up with only 10% of the fortune that their father left them. From this Midrash, the Zashim Shon says, it is evident that when God tells us, when the prophet Malachi tells us to tithe, to bring our ma'aser, to bring our charity to the temple, he's obviously talking about everything that we owe, because if only a portion is brought, we are obviously going to not be blessed on the fact that we are trying to cut the corners. So go back to your screen. Again, the question, the first question of Zeshim Shonsen is why does it say kol? Why does the prophet say bring all of your tithes to the treasury? Without that word, it could have been very, very obvious, obvious as well. Next question is, and this is a very important question. It says that God says, test me with this commandment. Test me with the commandment of giving charity, of tithing one's produce. We don't find any other commandment, asks the Zer Shimshon, that God allows us to test him in. I'll give you an example. A person is not allowed to say, God, I'm starting to keep the Sabbath 100%. I'm doing so. I'm testing to see if you will recognize my effort and you will give me X, Y, and Z. You will heal me. You will find a brighter groom for my child. You will promise to bless me with wealth. A person can't come and say, because I'm going to eat kosher, God, you have to reciprocate me by anything it is, any, anything at all, actually. We're not allowed to test God. The reason for that is, and we've spoken about this in many times, is because God's calculations we don't understand. We don't understand that we get the reward and the merit right away, a little later in life, in the world to come. These are all divine calculations that we do not understand. We've spoken about this multiple times. However, God says there's one commandment and one commandment only that a person may test God to see that if you give your 10%, you will not lose out. You will be sure to get back not only tenfold, but more than that. Meaning you give $10, God promises that you'll have your hundred again. This is a promise that God comes and says, test me with it. Now, there are many people that you can speak to that have overcome the temptation of being greedy with, with the money that they have. And they do share and they do give to the needy and support very worthy organizations. And many of them will come and tell you, if not all, that they do see the hand of God in their success and that this is a mitzvah, the mitzvah of giving charity that a person may go out and test God with. And therefore, the Zeshim Shon says, why is this the only mitzvah that a person may go and test God? Why not lighting Shabbat candles, keeping Sabbath, eating kosher, putting on tefillin? Why is this the one and only mitzvah that a person can test God with to make sure that he will not lose, but only gain from it. So the Zer Shimshon, so again, two questions. Why does it say to give all of the, all of the tithing? That's obvious. And second is why, the Zer Shimshon wants to know, why is this the only mitzvah you can test God with? Why is giving charity the only commandment you can test God with? The Zer Shimshon says there is a halacha, there is in the Talmud, as well in the Code of Jewish Law, a law that tells us that there are certain ways and certain loopholes to cut corners in how much a person really needs to tithe. For example, a person can exempt themselves from tithing their entire produce. How so? 
eating from their food in a temporary manner, feeding their workers, feeding their animals, for example. A person has a hundred baskets of apples, for argument's sake. So not getting too complicated in how much needs to be tithed and where it needs to go, but let's just say 10 baskets out of the 100 baskets need to be donated to the Cohen, the Levy, and the poor person. That leaves a person with nine baskets. But there is a loophole, and it's a valid loophole that the Talmud tells us, that if you did not already bring all of those apples into your warehouse and count them up properly and put them into piles, or in the middle of the workers or yourself working the land, you can eat apples, your animals can eat from it, and all of that does not count as part of your hundred. So theoretically, a person can very easily temporarily eat some apples, feed his family, feed his workers, feed his, feed his animals, and have only 90 baskets. And therefore, he would only have to give nine baskets of charity opposed to 10 baskets. You follow? That is all a legal, according to the Torah way, to avoid having to give all 10%. Instead of giving 10 baskets, you're only giving nine baskets or nine and a half, whichever way, however much a person abuses of this exemption. So theoretically, says the Zer Shimshon, there are ways to avoid giving the entire amount that needs to be tithed, but you're not transgressing anything. So comes the Zer Shimshon and says, you know what the verse in Malachi said to come with all of your tithings? The verse is coming and telling you, give all of your tithings, meaning don't look for a way to avoid having to give the entire 10%. Don't look for a loophole. Don't for, look for a way to cut corners to give your 10%. Because the only way that you can come and get the full reward and merit for tithing is when you give the 10% of your entire earning. That's going to be the way that you're going to have a blessing. So now... To continue, how does he answer the second question? Why is this the only mitzvah you can test God with? Aha, this he quotes the Talmud in Masechet Sota, page 14a, which we did learn two weeks ago. We shared this thought, the Zer Shimshon shared this thought with us in Parashat Vayetchanan, when Moses was praying to God to enter the land of Israel. The Talmud tells us that Moses prayed to God to enter the land of Israel because he wanted to be able to fulfill the mitzvot, the commandments that could only be fulfilled in the land of Israel. And furthermore, the, the, the Talmud continues, in order to receive the reward and the merit for doing so. On that, the Marsha asked, we spoke about this, how could Moses be preoccupied with the merit of receiving reward and, and merit for fulfilling those mitzvot, those commandments? That's what a simple person does. A simple person only thinks about the merit and the reward for fulfilling God's commandments. Right, we learned in the in, in the Mishnah, in the first chapter of Avot, the third Mishnah it says we are supposed to serve God al menat shilolekabel pras on with the intention to not receive reward. So how is it the Masha asks, and we spoke about this? How is it the Masha asks that Moses wanted to enter the land of Israel to fulfill the the mitzvot in order to get merit for it? So the Masha gives a fascinating answer. We didn't speak about this two weeks ago. We just gave the Zeshim Shon's answer. The Masha gives an answer, and the Zer Shimshon now answers everything with this. The Masha says there's a, the Masha differentiates between a person who's already commanded to fulfill a mitzvah to a person who is not yet commanded to fulfill this mitzvah. Meaning, a person who's already obligated to fulfill the mitzvah needs to serve God without the intention of the reward. However, if a person's not yet commanded to fulfill this obligation, no problem for them to have the desire for this reward. That was Moses. Moses had the intention to fulfill the mitzvot in the land of Israel even before they were commanded. And for that, he was allowed to have the intention and the desire for the merit and the reward. However, to us that we're already commanded those mitzvot, we're not allowed to fulfill them with the intention for their merit and their reward. Comes as Ereshim Shon and answers, based on this marasha, beautifully. You know why this is the only mitzvah we're able to test God with? The only mitzvah that we are able to test God to see that he will bluntly pay up 
pay us back is because when a person gives ma'aser, when they give their 10%, what they are doing is they are giving it, when they give their full ma'aser, they're giving it in a status of not yet obligated. Why? Because there are loopholes. You're not yet obligated to give your entire 10% because there could be loopholes or could be write-offs as we've spoken about. But a person who comes and gives their tithe, their 10% from all of their earnings, and we'll speak practically in a moment what that means, then they're able, and only then are they able to get up to God and speak up to God and say, God, I am testing you. God says, test me on this one, that I will be sure to repay you for your kindness. Basically, listen to the, listen to the novelty. If, if, maybe if I went too fast on anything else. The only time the Zer Shimshon says a person's allowed to test God to pay him, us back on the charity that we give is only when a person gives their full 10% on all of their earnings. If not, then no. Now, what does that mean practically to us? Because we don't have these loopholes of ways to avoid avoid. Uh, giving produce, feeding our animals, feeding, feeding our workers. So what it means practically is that when a person brings their paycheck home at the end of the month, at the end of the year, we are looking at what we've made after taxes. Because in essence, whether you have your taxes withheld or whether you're paid in full and then you have to pay back your taxes after, your income taxes I'm talking about, that money is not really yours to start with. You have a good accountant, you know how to finagle it a little bit to make it as kosher as possible and as beneficial as possible. If anyone needs a good accountant, I know a great one. And yeah, you're, that's it. Hit him harder. There he is. So what we mean to say here on a practical level is we have an obligation to tithe our earnings only post taxes, but not post all other expenses. You can't come and say, oh, well, I have a car. So, well, minus the car expenses before I give my 10%. Let's just use round numbers. So let's say a person's salary is $120,000 and $20,000 is back to taxes. So out of the $100,000 that a person makes, $10,000 would be 10%. But then a person comes and says, no, I spend $500 a month on cars. Boom, knock off 6,000 for the month. And I have another... X amount on my mortgage. Boom, knock off, knock off. A person says, oh, what do I have left? I only have $10,000, so I'm only giving $1,000 in charity. A person is using these type of loopholes that unfortunately they're not able to receive or even see the true benefit and blessing of even standing up to Hashem and saying, God, I'm testing you. I'm giving you when it hurts. I'm giving back to your those that need you, to the Jewish nation, to, to the poor people, to the Torah scholars, to the yeshivas, to the great organizations in our communities and worldwide. You can only stand up to God and test him, so to say, when you give your full tithing, when you give your 10%, when it is really due and not at a later time. So I hope I made myself very clear. This is not my novelty. This is the Zer Shem Shons Chidush, and it's, it's a beautiful one. It's something to think of now at the end of the year. Yes, there's two ends of the years. There's the tax year, and then there's the Jewish year. So Hashem counts our tzedakah, our charity, from year to year, from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. As we said, five, six weeks from now is Rosh Hashanah. So it's a time of the year to look back and make sure that in this past year, did we give 10% on our earnings? in order to receive that blessing that God promises that a person will not lose out, rather only benefit from giving charity and tithing our, our earnings or our produce. Last but not least on the same topic, the Zer Shon shares with us the very, a beautiful novelty on the very last verse in this week's Torah portion. The last, the end of this week's Torah portion speaks about the holidays, and specifically the three main holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, where the Jewish people have an obligation to ascend to Jerusalem and bring their sacrifices of when they come, their holiday sacrifices and others when they come to the land, uh, to, to, to Jerusalem and specifically to the temple for the holiday, thanking God for 
arriving to the holiday, being live and healthy and, and able to come to the, to the temple for the holiday and hopefully hoping and praying for the same success, hopefully for the upcoming holiday. Now, I'm going to share with you the last verse. Um, okay. Last verse of this week's Torah portion reads as follows. This is Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 17. Take a look at your screen. Ish kematinat yado. Every man shall bring as much as he can afford. Kevirkat Adonai Elohecha asher natan lach. According to the blessing of the Lord, your God, which he has given you. Pay close attention to Zeshim Shon says to this verse. And he actually asks two questions. He says, firstly, this verse is redundant. It says at first, Ish kimatinat yado, that a person should bring whatever they could, they could afford. And then it says, oh, according to the blessing that God gave you, come and give that. That should be given. Why the redundance, explains there, Shimshon. Either the first verse could have been good enough, the first part of the verse, or the second part of the verse could have been good enough. It is obviously redundant. Secondly, the Zer Shimshon wants to know, why is the beginning part of the verse referring to an ish, which means a person. And at the end, it says lach, meaning specifically to you. So the beginning is more general. And the end of the, the second time it commands it in this redundance, it's saying it specifically to you. So that's the two questions. Why the, re, the, re, why the repetition between the first part and the second part? Secondly, why is the first part referring to in general a person and the second part is referring to you specifically okay listen to what the Zer Shimshon answers the Zer Shimshon says that one second i'm trying to fix the screen okay the Zer Shimshon tells us that the verse is actually speaking about two different types of people and you're right the verse is repeating itself. And the first part is speaking about a certain group of type of people. And the second part is speaking about a second group of people. Listen to the two groups of people. The first group, the Zer Shimshon, is people who God has given them enough to live. Exactly what they need. However, no more. The second group of people are the group of people that Hashem blessed them with abundance. With what they need and more. With wealth. With possessions, with honor, with comfort. These are the two groups of people. Now, the Zer Shimshon reminds us that God has promised to give enough to every single person. He proves it from two different verses in Tehilim that we will share. Tehilim chapter 136 verse 25 reads, Noten lechem lechol basar chasto. God is one who gives bread to all flesh, for he is kind and he is eternal. Also in Tehillim, in the Ashrei, we read in chapter 145, verse 16, You open your hands, and God satisfies every living creature. There's not one person that is overlooked. There's not one creation, one creature that is overlooked. God promises to give people what they need. <clears throat> so therefore... The first type of person that only has exactly what they need, they're not necessarily indebted to God because God promised to give it anyways. The second type of person is indebted to God, however, because they have more than their bare necessities. And the Zer Shimshon qualifies them as a borrower, a borrower of what God has. Meaning God gives the person their main necessities, but then he gives more. Now quant now you are qualified as a borrower of the above abundance of God's possessions, so to say. So to explain, okay, this is the concept. Now we're going to make it practical to our question. To answer the first question of what the redundance of the verse, well, we said the first part of the verse is referring to the first group of people that have only what they need and the second part of the verse is referring to people who have even more the first part is referred to as ish as a person why because it's in general a person who has should give whatever they can afford they're not indebted to god to give way above and beyond they need to give what they can 
But the second part of the verse is referring to someone who was blessed with way more, with abundance, wealth, prosperity. That person is obligated to make sure they give even more. So to say, even more than they can afford, all based on what God blessed them with. And the second part, and this is the answer to the second question, the second part is lach, specifically to you. Why to you? Because then Shemeshon says, if you lend someone money, you take their name, their address down, you take their specifics, you want to know how to call this person up and say, hey, pay up, buddy. God, in the same way, does something very similar. When he gives someone extra, he, so to say, singles them out. And he keeps a divine tab. I've given you such and such extra. Let's see if you can actually live up to the charity that I expect you to give. God considers anyone who has more than they have, meaning to live, anyone who is blessed with abundance as a borrower. And he entrusts that borrower, just like the bank entrusts you when you come for a business loan. The bank trusts you that you are going to make back the money you borrowed in your business and pay up the interest. God, in a similar way, entrusts a person with wealth and looks and sees, is this a good investment? Should I keep on giving to this person, to this family, to this business? Are they doing good things with the money that I am entrusting them with? And then no problem. If you have a good credit line with God, no issues. It just expands and expands and expands and it gives more and more and more and more and allows you to be a conduit, a pipeline to helping many others. It's a beautiful concept. It's something which we need to realize that when we make God our partner, as he commanded us to, we will be blessed. But if chas v'shalom, God forbid, we forget our end of the deal because you shake your hand with God, so to say, God, you are my partner in this business. You're my partner this year. You are my partner from now on. God will bless you 100%. We just learned you could test him on it. But don't forget your end of the deal. Just like if you'd have a 50-50 partner or a signed partner, that's only 10%. If you forget them, they will turn their back on you and they will not keep on investing or working with you. Hashem is the same way. He lends us, he gives us, he's our business partner, but we need to make sure to give back to him. He doesn't want it for himself. Give it to the needy, give it to his children, give it to spreading Torah, give it to educating our children, give it to the great, great causes that the world needs, the Jewish people need, and God will keep on giving and giving and giving. So may Hashem bless us, the merit of tonight's class and the merit of Zer Shimshon, that we will always be blessed with more than, than what we just need to survive, with abundance, prosperity, until, as the, end, as the verse in Malachi says, until it's so much we don't have anywhere to put it. Alevai, please God. But we have to make sure that we live up to our obligation, to our end the deal of helping others and making sure that all those who need have making sure that our Jewish institutions, our educational institutions, our children's institutions, our Torah institutions, all have enough what they need in order that they can spread God's word and make sure that through the learning of Torah, people will observe more Torah and hasten the coming of the Mashiach. Amen v'amen. I want to thank all of you for listening tonight. And anyone who has any questions, will be able to unmute themselves at this point. I know they're going to be, I, I ended a little early because I know there are going to be some practical questions about uh, tzedakah and tithing and uh, anyone who wants to unmute, go for it. Isaac, go for it. You're always the first. <laughs> <laughs> so two things. The poor person, if I understood you right, he doesn't got, have to give the 10%. And the second thing, if uh, actually we're all out of Israel, we, we, I know that we have to give the 10%, but where does the concept come anywhere that we have to give the 10%? We don't have the land of Israel, we, we're here. Good question, amazing question. So to answer your first question with regard to a poor person, as the verse said, a poor person is obligated to give what he can afford. And if he cannot afford, 
So specific, um, practically speaking, a poor person is not uh, obligated to give charity. However, mm. I mean, that's the means if they can't cover their basic needs, they're not obligated to give charity. However, just like a poor person, even though it's on a different scale, if the poor person is short to give his 10%, even though he cannot afford it, he will not lose out from it. And God would be sh- will be sure to reciprocate and to bless the person to now have and have more and more and more and more. And for many people, the tithing and the charity takes them out of poverty. So to answer your question again, on one hand, a person who cannot afford gives a dollar, even though they're making $10,000 in the year, which is not a lot of money. And they should, so to say, be, oh, a thousand in in charity. If they give a dollar, they're good. But if they'll go the extra mile and give the thousand, which makes absolutely no sense, they will be sure to put up God to the test that they will not be poor and God, God will have to answer. So that's something to consider. With regards to your question of it used to be produce and nowadays it's not produce, God instituted and he commanded the Jewish people to give the charity in the system that the, Jew, that the Jewish people in the world were working in back in, the, in back in the day, which was everyone was farmers and everyone had produce and people bought and sold on that way. And the concept of money and tithing money is not so foreign because if a person had a lot of produce and it would be just too much for them to bring to the temple to give the Kohanim and the Levim and to anyone else and the poor people, what they were able to do was they were able to sell that produce and keep that money and bring that money to the temple on the times of the holidays and distribute it then. So it's not a specific, meaning, although conceptually and in the Torah it's written in in specifics to to produce, but it's not limited to that as well. But it's produce in Israel. How about out of the Israel? So that is that is a good question again the torah at that point when it was being written when it was written by god it was written with the intention that the jewish people will enter the land of israel this was the commandment god was giving them god was giving them through moses the commandment to enter the land of israel work this land and tithe this produce you understand yeah so the obligation of tithing produce outside of the land of israel is not uh, not something which we which we hold by, but still tithing our earnings is. Okay? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. It's not a question. It's just to um, better understand in Megillah's roots. Yes. When Nella had the money and he got tired of supporting B'nai Israel, what happened to him so it tie in my opinion it ties in very well what can happen when we don't give what we can give when we can give it beautiful thank you beautiful all right yes and mazal tov and my brook to the family thank you thank you very much eileen had a question okay so um hmm. okay so it's always good to give period and there are definitely different departments in giving. Yes. Giving to the sick, the needy, maybe a, a bride, um, a Torah scholar. So are there different priorities? Yes. The Rambam goes through uh, eight levels of priorities. Uh, I, I don't have them all off, off hand at this moment. However, he does differentiate um between the way we give as well to not only who the recipient is and the talmud as well as 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 many other sources do clearly and the rambam as well clearly differentiate in priority meaning that if a person's family is needy the charity should go to the family their family first whether it be needy is before a torah scholar Yes, I'm talking like basic essentials, totally. basic, basic essentials of food right. and, 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 you know, basic, basic essentials is, 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 is a number one priority. And, and I'm not saying that by you not giving, meaning, so let, let's take it this way. Family comes first. Okay. Ah. Supporting family. So taking care of your own family first is the first. Is the absolute first. Okay. Very the good. second, the second is 
the needy in your city. Oh, okay. Okay. In your city um, is, is that second realm. Now, the needy can also be, as you mentioned, Torah scholars, because if, if you don't, if people don't provide for the Torah scholars, well, then they will fall into, or they may already be considered needy people. So when you have two needy people after family, right. one's a Torah scholar and one isn't, then the Rambam does say you should give to the Torah scholar who is needy before the other person who, who isn't, okay? Then after one's city is actually one's country, after the country comes the needy or the institutions in the land of Israel. And then it would be to other places uh, around the world. But again, I think the, the important part is, is, is the needy in one's family is step one, and then within one city, and then, you know, Israel, and then, and then, the, and then the entire globe. So that, that is the importance. Now, it's like anything else in life. We shouldn't be putting all of our eggs in one basket whether that's in business or in, or in the stock market or in anything for that, for that, for that matter. And when it comes to giving charity, most people, and the, the normal thing to do is not to put all of your eggs in, in one basket, but to, to spread it out so that you're known as a generous person and, 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 a, and a kind person to all. And depending on a person's level and a person's wealth, it could be $10 to everyone. It could be $100 to everyone, $1,000 to everyone. It could be 100 to many and 1,000 to some. Because, again, it depends on where you feel like you want to give what God gave you to, to others. But, again, it's just like business. You need to try to give to a place where you think you'll get the best bang for your butt. I give to Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> Charity spots at home. Yehuda. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, is there any distinction to Matan Basseter? Yes. For so a regular donation? 100%. So the Rambam speaks about that. He says the highest level in giving charity is when a person gives and neither the recipient or the giver knows who it's going to or coming from. So let's say Mr. A is giving to Mr. B. And Mr. A doesn't even know who Mr. B is, and Mr. Meaning where the meaning he could know him, but he doesn't know that this thousand dollars is going to Mr. B. He gives it to C, and he trusts C to give it to the needy. So A gives money to C, and C gives it to B, and A and B don't know that it came from one another. That is the ultimate level the Rambam says of giving charity. Does the accountant know? Does the accountant know? <laughs> well, okay. it, it's obviously written off as 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 a as charity. Right. Okay. When you're back. When am I back? Tachlis, when I back. I'll be back in a week and a half, please, God. Wow. Looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rabbi. Yes, oh. Howard. Ra uh, Rabbi, when how are you? Shalom Aleichem. When you um, give to a Torah scholar who's somewhat needy, you're fulfilling two birds with one dollar, so to speak. You are. Right? That's why it is, it is the best bang for your buck, 100%. But at the same time, we don't want to leave out other Aniyam who are Pasha the Yidin, but we have to, as you say, diversify your charity exactly. and touch all your bases as much as possible. Exactly. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Yes. Um, Mrs. Yasmin Friedman. Hi, everybody. Um, what about tuition? Are we allowed to use Meister money for tuition? Good question. Good question. I, I've spoken about this in the past. I, uh, thank you for reminding me to bring it up again. The question that is asked is, can tuition that a person pays for their children or even, let's say, their grandchildren's school count as um, as, uh, as charity? For argument's sake, child goes to school, $20,000 a year, maybe even more, $30,000 a year. And you have, let's be nice, two kids. So two kids, $40,000, can that be considered as your charity? Well, the answer is as follows. If a person, it is a loophole, however, it can be a valid loophole. Now, according to the Zer Shimshon, can you test God with it if you consider it as your maaser? That's a good question. 
But what would be allowed is to consider the amount of money that tuition is being allocated towards Torah study or Hebrew study as maaser money. So for argument's sake, if your child's school has half Torah study or Jewish studies and half secular studies, you would be, according to the letter of the law, consider the 10,000 of the 20,000 per child as maaser, as tzedakah. Should that be the only maaser you give all year long? I highly suggest not so. Um, if you can afford to give 10% after you, uh, meaning not considering the tuition as your maaser, that is definitely the proper thing, the right thing to do. But again, if a person cannot just do it without it, then they would be allowed to do it. Can they go and test God by not considering that as their maaser and still give 10% besides for that? 100% yes. My only reservation is, is can you only test God if you don't consider it or not, like the Zer Shimshon said. That I don't know. I don't want to say it because I really don't know. But, but again, practically speaking, the Torah study or the Judaic studies that, that time-wise allocation that is spent at school can be written off as maaser, as, as the charity, the 10%, but not only that. I would say that. The Torah says you have to give a son, you're a teacher by Parnassah. So would that be considered tzedakah because you're teaching him a trade, you're following the halacha? Uh, amazing question. Okay, so let me just reiterate the question, Rabbi. Amazing question. The Talmud speaks about different forms of charity. And the ultimate form of charity, besides forgiving in a way where the person doesn't know that it's coming from you and you don't know who it's going to money-wise, but the ultimate form of charity is giving someone or teaching someone a trade. Meaning, the fam- as the famous saying goes, Instead of giving a person fish, you teach them how to fish. So investing your time in teaching someone how to fish or to provide for themselves, is that considered charity to the point where you can start deducting that from the ma'aser, the 10% that you owe? The answer is yes. Again, it's not the absolute ideal. If a person can afford 10% besides for that, They should go and do that. But if they can't, the answer is yes. And that means if a person is a professional in a certain area and they give of their time or they give of of anything they have to others or to an organization, that time may be considered at a fair or a regular for whatever that person charges as an hourly wage. And in their 10% 10% calculation, that can be considered as their tzedakah. I'll give you an example. Let's say a person is a graphic designer or a lawyer or any other type of profession, and they help out their local organization or their local uh, Jewish school or, or synagogue, whatever it is, and they are donating, they are volunteering a considerable amount of time and you know, let's say making a livelihood is still tough and, 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 you know, it's crunched. A person may consider those hours as if they were working for someone else. For argument's sake, let's just say $50 an hour. Or if you're a lawyer, $1,000 an hour, whatever the number is, okay? Or a discounted rate, whatever the case is. And you can tally up those hours and how much money that is. And if need be, those hours may be considered, converted monetarily and considered as if it is 10%. Again, is that an ideal thing to do? No. Is it something which is a permissible loophole? 100%. And it doesn't only need to be towards organizations. It could be towards anyone, towards anyone needy, in anyone in need of time or of your help or your expertise. Does it have to be Jewish? That is a very good question. We're still live on Facebook, so I don't want to give the answer just yet, but I guess you could understand what my answer is. Anyone else? Any other questions? We've had some great questions tonight. I'm happy we ended early enough so this way we've got some questions. Eileen, yeah. Do you get... Um, it's only a question. Do you get extra merit if you give immediately, like the speed of your decision in giving, opposed to, you know, kind of taking your time to coming around? Okay, that is a very, very good question because because you have two different elements playing at the same time. 
on one hand, it is living up to your obligation and the deal you made with God immediately, which if let's say you're on the other end of the, the side and let's say you're invested with someone, you would want your dividends right away or when promised. On the other side, there is the idea of scouting out and really locating what the best bang for your buck, what, you, what your, best, your best investment, so to say, in giving charity will be. So if you already know where you want to give and you've already vetted it and you know that that is the place where you want to give, so then, yes, there is extra merit in giving right away. By you giving right away, God's going to give you more of it back right away. Like, why wait? But if you do not know exactly where you want to give because you want to be sure of where you want to give, Honestly, not because you're trying to pull, you know, some type of skit or sketch, right? Then you could hold back. But again, from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah, all of our dues should be should be um, be given to the to the to the needy and and the ten percent as well. Beautiful answer, Thank Yehuda. You. If somebody is paying slowly. Does Hatarat Nedarim has anything to do with Nether to donate to a good cause? Very good question. And I know where you're, I know Yehuda, I can read you from, from thousands of miles away. I know what's going on in your head. <laughs> share with us. Let me, let me share with you my telepathic powers via Zoom and reiterate the question in other words. May I, Yehuda? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's say you are at a Jewish function or at a synagogue, and there is, I'll put it bluntly, a bidding war that takes place for a certain honor or for a certain donation, for a certain naming right, whatever it may be. And we'll go back to Mr. A and Mr. B, unless I should use people that are people's names that are on live with us what do you prefer what's more amusing okay let's just get back to it let's use a and b just so that we don't insult anyone a and b are bidding at each other a thousand two thousand three thousand four thousand five thousand six thousand ten thousand dollars mr a wins okay now normally speaking if it's for a certain project then it should be there for when the project is supposed to start if that was made clear to everyone, if it's just a more general, you know, the way most synagogues do it by the next high holidays, the next Rosh Hashanah, it should be paid off. But now your question is, is can someone come and annul the vow of their obligation that they made towards that synagogue or that organization? And the answer is unfortunately, no. You know why? Because what in essence, is happening is by A, not paying up his $10,000, he is causing the organization or the synagogue to lose the 9500 that Mr. B would have paid. So it's not, an, it's not only a question of between you and God, it's a question between you and that organization or that synagogue, because they are really, really like, like, like monetarily going to be losing out if you don't make that. What you are able to do is come to the organization or the synagogue and say, listen, it's tight for me. I can't pay up right away. Can I do some type of payment plan? And then any organization would be foolish to say no, because it's a donation after all, right? But, but, but between you and God, and, and what God really would like from you, and the proper thing to do is annulling any type of vow of a commitment that a person made does not work if it is in that type of setting of a of, of a, a bidding war because they were counting on it and they, you're, they're really losing it from elsewhere. Now, if it's not in a bidding situation, and let's say someone calls you up and say, Yehuda, I want to donate to your local synagogue $10,000. Great. Okay. Now, if the person makes that vow, but it's not like if I call you up and say, Yehuda, I'm, I, I want to retract it because something went sour or I don't believe in it or whatever the case is, I don't believe in the cause then the organization is not losing out, right? It's, it's a game that they're not losing on if it's not paid. Then there may be room for hatarat nedarim on such, for the annulling of that vow on such a uh, structure of a, of a donation. Of course, if you would come to rabbis, to the three rabbis of the Bedin and tell them why you are retracting it, I'm sure a good reason would need to be provided. And if a proper reason could be provided, let's say the person 
offered ten or a hundred thousand dollars, and they realize maybe the organization is mismanaging uh, the, the 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 funds, then that would be a valid reason to. Meaning, when you annul a vow, it has to come with a reason. You cannot just annul a vow for the sake of it. If a valid reason can be provided and there would be no loss to the organization, it would be permitted. Did I, did I, did I read? Did I read your mind well? Yeah, correct. Uh, it's really <laughs> hard. I was meaning more hardship, like somebody finally lost his job. So, or if, listen, honestly speaking, if a person really cannot afford it, then they need to communicate with the organization or the synagogue and say they cannot, and they'll give when they can, or or put me on type of type of a payment plan, even if it's small in the meantime, as a show of good faith, and then it will increase when things get better. From my observation of Temple Affairs for years, uh, the average of 80% of the donations are not collected nationwide, meaning that those that do the paperwork quickly send the invoice, and it's all rapid, and it's insisted to be promptly, are normally getting better success. But ordinary competitions show up and whatever in donations, uh, if they are not collected promptly, they decay. Right. Yeah, I, I find myself in the same situation. We had the high holidays last year, and uh, there is a large percentage which has still not uh, made wow. their made their commitments. But don't worry, Rush uh, Elul, a month before Shoshana, I will resend everybody and show good faith to hopefully fulfill their 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 commitments. That's <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I'm, I'm leaving time for one last question. It's getting late. No, yes. One last little thing. It's not even a question. It's not even a question. I just want to- um, Clarification. Welcome. I'm so proud. I feel like it's another daughter of mine signing on. And I want you to say a sweet hi to Hannah Littman. She's right here in the screen. She just She's a student at Ohio, but she lives here in Plantation and we, know her and her family for years upon years and she always joins us for Shabbos when she's here. I taught her how to make challah and I love her and I'm, I've been asking forever, come join, come join. And tonight she joined and Hannah, I have to say it, she said she loved it. <laughs> she you. loved everything and she can't wait to sign on again. So I want to well, warmly welcome her. I'm very welcome. proud of her. Thank you. Welcome, Hannah. I would add, unless, unless it's a question, I just want to add, let's say you're giving to a synagogue or a, a day school, but you're close with the rabbi, the educator, and you're doing it for that purpose to support his personal institution. And then the institution decides that, that, that they part ways with that rabbi. If you gave it on the motivation because you want that rabbi, I guess once you donate, it's difficult to, or that's up to the baton to see if you're able to break your letter. Very, very good question, Rabbi. Such a situation happened around a year and a half ago to yours truly. And, uh, and there was the high holidays and many, many people made large sums of donations. And then for whatever reasons, I left the synagogue that I was at. And many people came to me and asked me, Rabbi, do I need to fulfill the pledges that we made? We did them honestly, just because we know you're there and that you will do, you know, the best, the best with those funds and and build the organization and and the and the community. And the answer I gave then is specific to that situation, but then I'll tell you the proper answer as well. The answer I gave then was I can't be the one to answer that. As we say in Hebrew, I would be considered a nogea badavar. I would, I'm too close to the, to the scenario, to the situation to give an answer on that because it's obviously involving me. Um, however, the correct answer, even though if it would implicate me, I would not give an answer, but the correct answer is, is that you could annul that vow because like any other donation, it was given on with certain uh, preconceptions, pre-notions, um, intentions, and when those... Uh, when, when that or one of the main uh, identifications are no longer there or characteristics are no longer there, one that would be con constituted as, uh, as a reason to uh, properly back out. However, I would add 
that even though you can annul that vow, that amount that you pledged should still, you know, again, normally a person gives 10%, still should go somewhere, if you understand what I mean. Rabbi, you're with us? Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, I hope I, I hope I saw myself clearly. And I didn't mean to bring up your name, but uh, I would just, but if, let's say it's, you know, a family member is head of a school or whatever it is, so the idea is you want to give, and, and you probably, well, you should still probably should give something, but you explain why you're reallocating it because it was this person, but I don't, I don't mean you necessarily, but anybody, because I felt his leadership was what's making this legitimate organization or building it or whatever it is. And I don't feel that without that leadership, I don't feel it's an organization is complete, I should say. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just not complete. It's not where you want to invest your donation, so to say. Right. And that okay. was the motivation, if not, you know, okay. Good. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. It was great to see everyone. Welcome to all our newcomers. Welcome, <laughs> Hannah. Um, nice to see you again, Mark, Yasmin, Bracha, Eileen and Ron, Aviva, Yehuda, and all those who are hiding your beautiful faces. Welcome and great to see Not everyone. So. Thank you, Ron. Good night, so. good night, everybody. Good night, Not everybody. So to Adam. Everybody you. be healthy and be safe. Thank Amen. you, Thank you. Oh, Valerie, nice to see you. A big mazel tov to your family. Thank you.